Hi, welcome to the first video for securitycolony.com. My name's Nick Ellsmore, I'm Chief Apiarist at Hyvent, and I also run the securitycolony.com business. Information security is an area where we really have to share information and have to collaborate. And ultimately, our whole security colony platform is built with that in mind. In 2016, if we're not helping each other solve our cybersecurity problems, then ultimately, we're giving the bad guys a significant leg up and it doesn't need to happen. The reason we're putting these videos together is to share information that we're seeing across our client base. We work with a range of companies from big to small, from financial services to online gaming, health insurance, government, a whole range of different industry sectors. But what we realize is that the problems organizations are facing have actually a lot more in common than you might think. So what we're trying to share through these videos is some information that might help you see what others are dealing with and how you then might be able to apply that to your business too. The more we can learn from each other and the more we can benchmark against each other, the better off we're all going to be. Today I'm going to be talking about three specific projects that we're seeing quite mature organizations rolling out at the moment. 2016 has been a pretty exciting year for good reasons and bad reasons. Uh, we're certainly seeing a lot of organizations investing pretty heavily in cyber uplift programs. They're doing a lot of work in a lot of different areas. But ultimately the reason for that is that a lot of organizations are having data breaches and there have been some pretty major incidents. Today the three projects that I'm going to be talking about are cyber crisis management, endpoint protection, and third party vendor risk management. And these are all areas that we're seeing quite mature organizations focusing on. So the first of the projects that I'd like to talk about is cyber crisis planning. Now cyber crisis planning in Australia particularly has become a very topical issue because we've just had the census. Or at least we tried to have the census and it didn't go so well. Um, for those who aren't in Australia, uh, we attempted to have our online census and the site fell over pretty catastrophically on the night that it was meant to be uh, front and center in, uh, in pretty much every living room in Australia. By now, you probably have an incident response plan. If you're a big enough organization, you probably also have a crisis management plan. The question that we're seeing a lot of organizations asking and the project that becomes cyber crisis planning is effectively where those cross over. So the question is, when does a cyber security incident become a crisis for the organization? The census is a pretty clear example. That was a crisis. It was on the front page of every newspaper. It was the lead story on every news channel. Pretty clear that that's a crisis. But most cybersecurity incidents aren't that clear cut. If you have a malware infection and a couple of PCs get infected, it's probably not a crisis. It's just business as usual. If you have a data breach because someone mistakenly sends out an email and you leak one patient record or one piece of information, it's probably not a crisis. It's not good, but it's probably not a crisis. But at some point, that becomes a crisis. And figuring out where that threshold is, whether it's one record, whether it's 10,000 records, whether it's a million records, is really important. A lot of the work that we're doing at the moment is trying to map together these different documents that are often owned by different parts of the organization. And that's starting to ask the question, when does a cybersecurity incident become a crisis? And there are a whole range of attributes that could feed into that. This slide shows the levels of incident that one of our clients use for categorizing up to a crisis. Level zero being business as usual, level one being an uncontained incident, two being a contained incident, and level three being a crisis. It could be when the media starts asking questions. It could be, in a malware case, when the incident is clearly uncontained, when you either can't figure out what the problem is, or you figured out what the problem is, but you simply can't control the problem. You can't actually manage the incident. In those cases, it would escalate to be a crisis. And the question ultimately is about whether you want to err on the side of false positives, which is escalating more things to the crisis management team when they're really just business as usual, or false negatives, which is having crises eventually occur and it's too late by the time you escalate it. And obviously the former, generally speaking, is going to be a more risk averse uh, approach than the latter. Another area that's important to clarify is around external engagement. 
Who are the cybersecurity team allowed to contact without getting formal approval from either the PR team, the corporate communications team, or legal and regulatory affairs? This slide shows an example from one of our clients with details of the organizations that the cybersecurity team is or is not allowed to engage directly in the case of a cybersecurity incident. For example, in an incident, you'll probably need to be able to call CERT to call the Australian Cybersecurity Centre, uh, potentially to be able to call some of your peers in other organisations to ask, are they seeing the same thing? Do they know anything about the particular incident that you're encountering? And the counterpoint to that is that there are a number of types of organisations like the police, like regulators, like the media, and of course like customers, that you really need to have formal approval processes in place before you actually send out messaging there. And again, looking at the census example, the inconsistency of the messaging there arguably is one of the things that caused the greatest impact. It really is critical in crisis planning to engage non-IT parts of the business early on, particularly corporate communications and legal, who both are going to be very involved if there's a data breach type situation. Getting any messaging worked out and discussed ahead of time is really important. The last thing you want is to end up in a crisis and have someone on the spur of the moment declare it an attack from China and a sophisticated attack, just like everyone else, and that end up not being the case. Because there's only one thing worse than delaying messaging, and that's giving out messaging early on that is wrong. So if your organization has a crisis management plan or a crisis management team, one of the things we certainly recommend is looking at how that ties into your cybersecurity incident planning processes and making sure that the two knit together neatly. The second project that we're seeing a lot of organizations rolling out at the moment is endpoint security. Now, endpoint security or endpoint protection is about as old as IT. Historically, it's mainly been antivirus technology, uh, but as a vice president of Symantec himself said in 2014, antivirus is dead. Admittedly, he doesn't work there anymore, but the point probably still stands. Fortunately, new endpoint security technologies have started to be released in the last few years, and they're making significant inroads into a lot of the vulnerabilities that other technologies have simply failed to address. Technologies like CrowdStrike, Silence, Tanium, Carbon Black, and Last Line have all started to innovate and create new ways of addressing endpoint security threats. Generally speaking, they're reasonably lightweight technologies and organizations are getting a lot of value and a lot of success out of putting them in place. For too many years, we've been loading control upon control upon control. And every time a new security technology is being created, we've had to find a new budget, we've had to find more money. Fortunately now, we're starting to see some of these new technologies are actually replacing existing controls. Now as a security manager, that's actually a hard discussion to have because it requires quite a degree of courage. If you're turning off a control, that's actually going to be introducing a significant amount of risk for you personally. Because if it turns out that that control subsequently was needed, obviously you're going to be the one to blame. But that being said, we can't do this forever. We can't keep adding control upon control and adding more and more cost. There has to be a point at which we say, this control is strong enough to replace some historical controls. And endpoint protection is starting to look like the point where that can start to happen. And the third project that we're seeing a lot of organizations rolling out now is third-party risk management. Now, third-party risk management, or as it's otherwise known, supply chain management is a very broad field. Um, the World Economic Forum has written a number of papers on supply chain risk management that are primarily focused on shipping, on transport, and on broad supply chain infrastructure. But from an IT perspective, what we're talking about is where are you getting your computers from? Where are you getting your code from? And who's running your systems? Who has access to the data that you as an organization control? Um, as Marcus Ranham once said, if the software controls your computer, then whoever wrote that software also controls your computer. The slide on the screen now shows some statistics on the importance of third-party risk management using statistics from the Ponemon Institute. 
As a demonstration of the importance of third-party risk management, some of the biggest breaches that we've seen over the years have had this at their core. Target being a prime example, which is reported to have been the result of a compromise of their HVAC system. These days, pretty much every organisation is looking for agile ways to work and is using the buzzword of innovation. One of the things that that necessarily implies is increased speed to market. And to achieve increased speed to market, one of the things organisations look at is the build versus buy question. And generally speaking, buying is going to be a lot faster than building. Given that increased focus on buying in technology and capability, you then need to have a really robust process for assessing the risk that that organisation and that that technology is going to pose to you and your customers' data. This slide illustrates the elements that make up a mature third-party cybersecurity assessment process. Organisations need to develop a process that balances the risk that their vendors pose with the cost that the process itself creates. But at the end of the day, it's not going to be enough to just send out an Excel spreadsheet and get a self-assessment questionnaire back from the vendor. The process needs to be more sophisticated than that. What we're seeing leading organisations doing now is putting in place really mature and enhanced processes around vendor risk management. This has both an automation component and it also has a technical component in terms of trying to get a view of the organization's risk profile of a vendor organization's risk profile over the internet. So looking at things like SSL and TLS configuration, um, looking at SPF records and DKIM, um, looking at spam blacklists, looking at breach intelligence databases, and trying to get an understanding not just of how an organization represents themselves in a questionnaire, but from a technical security perspective, how they realistically represent themselves online. The last key is having an ongoing process there as well. Some organizations that are doing interesting work in this area at the moment are companies like Security Scorecard, BitSight and UpGuard from the technical side of things and the Shared Assessments Program and the Open Group in terms of the questionnaire side of it. Hopefully this video has been helpful in showing you what some other organisations are rolling out at the moment in their cybersecurity uplift programs. We really believe that the more organisations can collaborate and share information in cybersecurity, the better off we're all going to be. If you found this helpful and if you'd like to see more about what other organisations are doing, please sign up for a free account at securitycolony.com. There you can access a whole range of resources that we've put together for other organisations through real consulting projects. It's real information, it's battle tested, and it'll help you get a really good understanding of what other organizations are doing right now.